Hi, I'm Tony Kent, and this is another episode of Tony Kent Writes and Cross-Examines. Uh, I'm not going to make another comment about how there is no cross-examination in any of these videos, uh, but, well, I guess I just have made that comment. So today, the person that I won't be cross-examining, but I'll be having a nice, gentle chat with, is uh, a person that I regard as one of my big rivals after reading her, reading her most recent book, Curse the Day, uh, that is former journalist and Sunday Times best-selling author, Judith O'Reilly. Uh, Judith writes the Michael North books, uh, beginning with Killing State, and most recently uh, released this year, Curse the Day, and they are books that you have to read. Um, and hopefully, in, within the next 15 minutes, you'll find out why. Judith, thank you for coming along. Hi, Katie. Thank you very much for the invitation. Well, when I say coming along, neither one of us has actually left our house because we are not allowed to. And I don't think we can pretend this is essential, can we? So um, uh, how are you doing? How are you dealing with the lockdown? I'm all right, actually. Uh, I had my book to launch at the start of it. And then, uh, like you, I got corona. So I had to um, get through that. And now I'm into um, outlines for books uh, three and four. So I've, I've been really sort of um, focused, apart from the time where I actually had to stop everything because I'd sort of fallen over. Uh, and I think possibly that's helped. Yeah, a bit of a break is quite a helpful thing, isn't it? I launched PowerPlay on the uh, on the 16th of April. And up to that point, I've been working very hard on, um, <clears throat> on book four. Uh, because I think I'm not sure whether I've explained this to you. I, but my, my original book floor was all about a pandemic and the pandemic being a being a weapon that was being used by a rogue Asian state. So I thought a bit close for comfort. So I had to start uh, start again, start from scratch. And I was doing a lot of videos uh, documenting this starting from scratch. Um, and I, after the launch, I took two, I took ten days uh, between videos. And the difference that that 10 days made was absolutely enormous. I mean, I went back and I got rid of a third of the book that I've been writing and and it just made so much more sense. I mean, is that what you're experiencing? Well, I'm really, really bad at stopping. Mm -hmm. um, and it, you shouldn't, you should really stop because apparently, you know, you get cortisol and adrenaline and then you just go into this sort of, you know, state of like permanent hypervigilance, which I think I'm in. I think a lot of uh, my generation she sort of started working really hard, really early, and then um, I think it's really bad for you, you, you know, your mental health, your emotional health, and your physical health. But we just can't can't stop working, you know. Probably good for a writer, you know, yeah. um, because you have to be quite relentless, as you know, if you're going to be a writer and able to drive yourself. Yeah, yeah, you've got to put the words on the page. Um, you haven't got to be the kind of person who looks elsewhere for approbation or you know congratulations you've got to think no this is good it's worth publication um so yeah yeah so i, I need to stop more really well as i say I, i've as i think we were saying before we uh <clears throat> before we started recording i i think I, I first started working when i was 10 or 11 with my dad as a bit where he's a tarmacker um don't read anything into that as terms of background is concerned but about 10 10 or 11 years old i was pushing a tarmac um wheelbarrow and i've not really stopped working since then so so this feels very weird yeah it's interesting because i did um some uh rich list stuff or was it parent power i did anyway i did a big feature of the sunday times about um multi-millionaire entrepreneurs and to a a man they did happen all to be men uh they had all started working at about 10 mm -hmm. and they'd all started with a uh, second um then they'd gone into second job so they you know they'd flog things on the side and they'd yeah. have a news round or a um a milk round or something then they'd set up work um uh, their own sort of business really early but it was the same pattern of behavior really yeah it's incredible isn't it i mean well, my, i have a friend who is who happens to be on that on that rich list a chap i grew up with uh, who always makes the rest of us seem like we're really low achievers. <laughs> um, he started out, he was born in a caravan by the side of the, I think it was the A12, uh, and is now worth, I think, £500 million. And you just look yeah. at that and you think, yeah, I can, I can see how, though, because, of, like, as you say, he was working, working, working for our whole lives. Um, it was never anything other than an opportunity. Everything was an opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I, I think you're like me. I think you're very driven, aren't you? Uh, yeah, I like to make sure everything is, uh, yeah, I don't like, I am quite driven, but I'm also bored. I also don't like to have nothing to do. 
So it's helpful. It's helpful to have an ambition and to, and to want things to succeed, whilst also having an inability to do nothing. But anyway, we, what we need to talk about, because five minutes of our 15 minutes is gone, and we have not yet mentioned Curse the Day. Um, the two, you say you're writing books three and four, are they both in the Michael North series? Uh, yeah, they are. Um, and probably like you, uh, my book four wasn't going to be about a pandemic, but it was going to have medical overtones. Yeah. So I've had to um, alter that. Um, yeah, I, I've got something I'm quite excited about for book three. Um, mm -hmm. I did wonder about how much to put tech in. I had tech in my first one, tech in my second one. Lots think, of tech in the second one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, artificial intelligence, reaching consciousness. Um, and actually, I do think with AI that uh, it's one of the biggest challenges that we've got, and it's coming up very fast on the rails. And it's complete, It's completely out of people's scope. People aren't really recognising it. No. We, we're recognising the environment, and we have to, and we're right to recognise the environment. The bigger threat is almost certainly that. Yeah, and the fact that you know our relationship with machines is going to have to change. It's got lots of issues to do with ethics and robot rights, et cetera, yeah. where it leaves us um, <clears throat> when AI reaches consciousness, what that will mean for mankind. Yeah. Um, and sort of people are vaguely aware of it, you know, on the peripheral vision. People have seen the Terminator. <laughs> like they've, heard, they've heard the term sentience and they've heard AI and all that stuff, but I don't think many people have thought too much about it. Yeah, I, mean, I really think they should start thinking about it because in the same way as this pandemic came and again, yeah. it was in a peripheral vision and there was emergency planning, but people didn't put the money or yeah. time into it, etc. I mean, this is happening. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you've obviously researched the life out of that because that's that's the, the, the driving theme of Curse the Day. Curse the Day is about the, the threat, isn't it, of the, of the AI, which is called SID, uh, and uh, effectively the, the, the race to control it. Yeah, and can you control it? Yeah, yeah. What it what it means for us, and also um, lethal autonomous weapons, mm -hmm. which are out there now and are being yeah. developed now by defence companies, are being put into action by um, you know countries. Uh, there's you know big moves to try and stop them. You know, yeah. uh, pro to be proactive about it in the same way as we had landmine uh, yeah. bans, etc. But people don't have any sense of urgency <coughs> about it. And <coughs> they really should. You know, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a thriller writer. But um, before I wrote thrillers, I was a, a national journalist. I'd worked on the Sunday yeah. Times. I'd worked on Channel 4 News, Newsnight. And I was really shocked by the kind of things I was turning up when yeah. I was researching the book. Oh, it's, it's incredible because it's also developed so fast, isn't it? I mean, you, you back in your previous career, you, if you've touched upon that sort of that's that, that kind of thing, the development is just so exponential that, that it would have been what would seem like decades have advanced in just a few years. Yeah, and consciousness, um, they say, you know, we will reach within sort of, you know, um, a few decades. So mm. the thing that I was um, talking about in Curse of the Day was just bringing that forward. So yeah. literally it happens. Um, there's a uh, big, sexy uh, British AI tech company, yeah. and um, all of a sudden, uh, they have this amazing sort of computer system, and poof, all sorts yeah. of murder and mayhem kick off as a result. Well, I mean, that, that's that's the sort of background to, to, to this plot for this book. But you've got your recurring character, who I've got to talk about because he's one of my absolute favourites. I've got two favourites at the moment. One of them is Michael North. The other is Conor Fraser, who Neil Broadfoot writes. Um, they're both in the kind of they're both in the archetype because I mean, as is Joe Dempsey, who I write, it's just the reality of, of our genre. But I think all three of those I've just mentioned stand alone. I think they stand alone in a way that a lot of a lot of them characters don't. And Michael North stands alone, not not just I think it's the nihilism of Michael North, it's sort of fatalism. Um, he's I, th I, th I think he's an exceptional protagonist and. We know that in Killing State, of course, he, he suffers a, an extreme loss and that loss is kind of driving him on in the way he lives his life and the way he interacts and, and deals with things. Uh, and then he finds himself dealing with the um, effectively threatened, physically blackmailed into getting involved uh, with the search for Sid, the AI. Where did Michael North come from? I mean, what, what was your driving force in terms of creating this particular protagonist? Well, um, 
as a sort of you know Catholic background, uh, you sort of grow up with this sort of um, morality and mortality sort of uh, just all over, you know. Um, yeah. And I think that sort of permeated my writing quite extensively. So I think if we're, not to get too gothic on this, but if we're surrounded by sort of, you know, death and death mm -hmm. in life, okay, I sort of wanted um, that reality uh, to be part and parcel of my hero. Yeah. So, you know, you know yourself, um, you've got to have a hero in jeopardy and you've got to have, you know, personal stakes in these action adventures that you and I are writing. Yeah. Um, I thought if he actually had a, he, he was an ex-soldier, if he'd taken a bullet to the brain, then he was literally living with the knowledge that he could die at any second. I think yeah. so could we all. Yeah. What would that mean? You know, what would that mean in terms of your decision making? Um, I mean, in a way, we're all living with it now with Corona. You know, people have been living with and adjusting to the fact that there's a dangerous disease and we could all die. So have we changed our behaviour? You know, have we reached out for different people? Have we said, I love you more, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. Um, have we helped others? Have we protected our own family first and foremost? So um, there's nothing very sort of original about an ex-soldier um, as a hero, uh, but... Um, and, there's, and you also have to have a wound, as you know, a sort yeah. of, you know, a, an external wound and an internal wound. Yeah, it's got to be so, something. Yeah. So um, I really liked the idea that he is so determined to make every second he has left count yeah. because it makes it very sort of theatrical, theatrical operatic, but yeah. it also makes him very, very fundamentally human. Yes. No, I mean, that's, that's really interesting. I tried to do something similar with, with Joe Dempsey. I have Joe Dempsey. Um, I see him as, as somebody who was effectively indoctrinated at an early age. Um, he's somebody who was in the British Army and they and he, and he becomes a killer for the state. But in very much the same way as, as someone who's been indoctrinated by Islamic terrorism, for example. You know, it's just, it, it's just, we call it training. But at the same time, he, he believed he was indoctrinated to the extent he believed everything he did was right because he was told to do it by the state. And then it takes him to a certain amount of years for, for the wall to come up, uh, to sort of come off of his eyes. And his driving force, again, a very Catholic driving force. I have the same background as you. Very Catholic driving force is he's then, the rest of his life is being spent righting the wrongs that he's done. Not to the same people. He's not going back to make sure that yeah, the people he hurt are okay because that's impossible. But he's just trying to get, I guess, a bit of karma in the sense. So, so a similar kind of thing. We've, we've got that sort of driving force for both of our characters who are, yeah. Uh, yeah, they're, they're driving, again, the, the inner turmoil. They have the inner turmoil of, of, of a different sort. Well, it, it, it is um, difficult when you have heroes who kill. Mm, yeah. What, what you do with that. So I did consider at the start uh, making Michael North um, a, you know, sociopath. Uh, along the sort of Tom Ripley uh, yeah. lines, but I didn't want to spend years of my life uh, with someone like that. Yeah. Um, so you've got to like them, haven't you? You need to like them. You've got to like them, yeah. So they have um, committed extrajudicial murders. Yeah. You know, there's no way around that. Um, so what does that mean? You know, how can they justify that? How can they live with that? How can they live with themselves? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, basically. Uh, and also, Michael um, has a uh, sidekick called Fang Fang Yu, yes. who's 14, and she's a um, Chinese Geordie geek. And she has a very strong sense of right and wrong. Yeah. And um, she kind of, she's kind of a, of, a, of a guide for him, isn't she, in many ways? Yeah. Yeah. She is a, she is a sort of a conscience and she's supposed to be super mm. smart. And she's also willing to ask questions and yeah. make him ask questions uh, because, you know, um, when you've got a hero, as you know, at the centre of um, thrillers, you know, you've got to let them grow, but at yeah. the same time, they have to remain um, authentic and have okay. integrity from the start. So that's quite a hard one to um, to, to, to balance out, yeah. you know. Uh, I did warn you uh, before we started that I would lose track of time. I have lost track of time. We've got 10 seconds. So, Judith, I'm going to say the following. People need to read your book. It's one of the best books that I have read in a very long time. 
Thank you very much for coming along. Thank you for having me. Thank you.